Empirical provide compelling, interactive learning across a range of delivery options. Live on site, live online, or online anytime, we have a training course that is ideal for you. For a no-obligations chat about your training requirements, contact us at empirical.com. Hello and welcome to 5G Wireline Access. This course actually builds upon our 5G system engineering course and therefore we're going to assume a basic understanding about how 5G actually operates. If 5G is new to you, then perhaps it may be more advantageous to take a look at that course first before progressing through the 5G wireline access course. Okay, so let's begin then with the 5G wireline access architecture and really ask the question, what will 5G wireline access actually bring us? Well, one of the key drivers for this is actually termed seamless mobility. We now will have the ability for our devices to connect not only through the traditional 5G radio-based network out to the G node Bs, but also via a wireline or a fixed network. The common thing here is that whichever access net that we're going to use, we're going to come back to the same common 5G core. This really brings through the second advantage. Because we can hit the same 5G core, we can then share the same broad access capabilities to lots of other devices. Think of your router or your cable modem at home, the number of devices that will connect through to it, be that a television, laptops, tablets, or maybe a whole plethora of IoT devices. These two now can actually use the services of the 5G core and advantages such as things like network uh, slicing, etc. What we should point out, however, is the wireline network itself is not defined by the 3GPP. Instead, depending upon whether it's based on a broadband DSL type format or a cable network based on DOCSIS, the actual technical specifications will be under the control of the, either the broadband forum or cable labs. Now, we're not going to go into the detail of how these particular physical networks operate. You can find the technical specifications for these on the relevant websites. Instead, we're going to be focusing upon the 3GPP and how we can connect these wireline networks into our 5G core. OK, so the first part of the network architecture we're going to look at are actually the residential gateways. And these come in two flavours. The first one here, the 5G residential gateway, which we can see down at the bottom of the screen. This provides the connection from the various home network devices, be that computers, IoT devices or televisions, etc., across the Y4 reference, which is our cable or our broadband network, again defined by either the broadband forum or cable labs, arriving into the 5G network through a node we refer to as the wireline access gateway function. More about that later. But through this function, then, we arrive into the 5G core. Again, our standard functions we've seen before, the AMF, the SMF, and the uh, UPF, the user plane function. Now, the thing we should stress particularly about the 5G residential gateway is that it also supports the N1 reference. And this is between the 5G residential gateway and the AMF. And this will be used for carrying NAS signaling, non access stratum, for things like registration, establishing PDU sessions, security, uh, etc. So to all intents and purposes, the 5G residential gateway looks like a, a standard 5G device. However, in this case, it's connecting through a wireline fixed network as opposed to our 5G radio network. The other flavour of residential gateway is termed the fixed network residential gateway. And this is really dealing with legacy connections. Again, from the diagram, it doesn't look too dissimilar to the 5G variant. Again, connecting our devices within the home, computers, tablets, IoT devices, etc., through to the 5G core. Once again, passing through our wireline access gateway function. But this time, we refer to it as Y5, but this too will be defined by the broadband forum or cable labs. The most significant difference here for our fixed network residential gateway is that it does not support the N1 reference or the NAS signaling. 
Instead, this passes between the AMF and our wireline access gateway function. In other words, the fixed network residential gateway doesn't really understand any of the protocols of the 3GPP. So then, whether we're talking about a 5G residential gateway or a fixed network residential gateway, they will be connecting into the 5G core via the wireline access gateway function. And it's this that we're going to focus on now to see what the type of services that it's capable of supporting. So, what can it do? Well, to begin with, we can see that it actually terminates the Wi-Line network across Y4 or Y5. Again, it must be capable of supporting the Broadband Forum or the Cable Lab's technical specifications, DOCSIS, for example, in our cable networks. Understand the signaling protocols and how we can establish our data sessions across these fixed networks. Likewise, it must also terminate the standard 3GPP-based connections be that N2 towards the AMF using the NGAP protocol, or in the case of the user plane, N3 towards our UPF, the user plane function, again using the protocol GTPU. In the case of our fixed network residential gateway, we also must be able to terminate N1. That's the NAS signaling, the non-access stratum signaling between the AMF. Again, this must be terminated here at the wireline access gateway function and mapped onto the proprietary uh, broadband or cable signaling protocols down to the fixed network residential gateway. We also need to support AMF discovery. So when our 5G or our fixed network residential uh, gateways connect up into the network, it's important that we can attribute the correct AMF, the access mobility management function, which will be dealing with their registration. Again, this can be done fundamentally through identities which can be passed up to the wireline access gateway function, namely the 5G GUTI or the GUMI, our globally unique AMF identifier. We've also got the handling, we can see here, of our N2 signaling from the SMF. Now, even though the SMF will not directly connect through to the wireline access gateway function, it will pass the signaling via the AMF, signaling associated with things like PDU sessions, etc. Also, we should note that the YLAN access gateway function deals with both, not uh, the, sorry, say, deals with the user plane and the control plane, and therefore, in the case of the user plane, it will be responsible for passing uplink and downlink data between the residential gateways and the UPF. And finally, regarding this user plane data, it's important to also stress that we can deal with quality of service enforcement and the actual packet marking. Unlike uh, networks such as Wi-Fi offload, which will simply release the data onto the uh, internet in a best effort-based format, across our broadband or our cable networks, we are also capable of supporting defined quality of service. So therefore, the mapping between our 5G PDU sessions and the relevant data sessions across the cable or broadband networks also need to be taken into account, a responsibility of our wireline access gateway function. OK, so now let's just take a look at the various control and user plane protocol stacks across these various connections. And this will help to understand, really, the difference between the 5G and the fixed network residential gateways. So to begin with, then, let's take a look at the control plane for the 5G RG, our 5G residential gateway. And across N2, then, we can see that this is a standard uh, protocol stack, again, defined by the 3GPP with NGAP sitting at the top, using the services of SCTP, down through IP layer 2 and layer 1. N2 here, down towards our wireline access gateway uh, function, but would also be the same between the AMF down to a, a GMB, in the case of our radio-based access networks. Across Y4, then, we can see that the protocol we're using here is defined as the wireline control protocol. This will be specifically defined by either the Broadband Forum or Cable Labs. Again, it's dependent upon the physical medium which our wireline network is supporting. However, the actual control protocol itself, regardless of whether it's broadband-based or cable-based, will fundamentally carry these uh, key uh, requirements. To begin with, then, we've got the establishment of an EAP signaling connection. EAP, our Extensible Authentication Protocol, 
will be used initially to set up a signalling connection, in this case across Y4, between the 5G residential gateway and our Y-line access control function. Eventually, once we have the EAP success, then we can transition over to standard wireline control protocol based signaling for the rest of the connection. In addition, we have the transfer of access stratum parameters. Access stratum running across Y4 and N2, supporting the NAS based signaling, uh, which will run between the actual uh, gateway and the AMF. And finally, the management of our wireline user plane resources, again per PDU session because we want to apply quality of service, not just within the 5G core, but across the access network as well, we need to allocate the associated user plane resources across the fixed network. And then sitting across the top, we can see in this case we have NAS, the non-access stratum, which will be running from the AMF down to the 5G residential gateway. Switching TAC then onto the fixed network residential gateway, our legacy type device, we can see that N2 is exactly the same. Likewise, we also have a proprietary-based uh, signaling protocol running across Y5, and this time referred to as the legacy wireline control protocol, once again defined by the Broadband Forum or Cable Labs. What's worth pointing out here, however, is that it's actually the N1 uh, connection, our NAS signaling, okay, will run across N2 in this situation. Remember, in the case of our fixed network residential gateways, NAS will terminate at the wireline access gateway function. Switching then attack onto the user plane, and once again returning back to the 5G variant here, we can see that N3 now is operating between the, uh, the wireline access uh, gateway function and the UPF, the user plane function, and this will be the standard uh, protocols okay, in accordance with the 3GPP. GTPU, sitting on top of UDP, IP, etc, etc. Again, much the same as N3 would look between the UPF and the G node B in standard 5G architectures. Across onto Y4, onto the wireline part of the connection, well here we have the protocol wireline user plane operating, once again defined by the two organisations, but regardless of the physical uh, implementation, this protocol will support the same standard type of uh, features. That being support for the wireline user plane resources, again mapping these to QFS flows. So again, based on the PDU sessions and we setting up of our QFS flows across the network, we need the associated physical resources across the 5G wireline network uh, to enable us to continue to carry the data in the correct format. Uplink and downlink transmission in accordance with that QFS profile. It's all very well setting up the connection, but we need to enforce it again and physically allocate those resources. And finally, managing the 3GPP base QFS parameters, again, and mapping them either onto the broadband or the cable network. And sitting across the top, we have the PDU layer, which again is our user traffic as far as we're concerned, be that IP, maybe unstructured data or Ethernet frames. And that just leaves us then to look at the user plane for the fixed network residential gateway. Again, very similar here, sitting on N3, once again, standard 3GPP based defined. But this time, now across Y5, we have the legacy wireline user plane protocol. Again, carrying out much the same sort of functions with our uh, PDU layer sitting across the top as we transfer our user traffic across these 5G wireline access networks. The final thing that we want to look at is an extension to the architecture we've previously seen. Here we're going to refer to it as uh, our fixed wireless access or hybrid access. Now on the diagram we can see the architecture we've previously seen, the 5G residential gateway connecting into the 5G core, in this case through the wireline access gateway function. The difference here though in the case of fixed wireless access is that the same 5G residential gateway can connect into the 5G core but through the 5G radio network, in this case out towards our G node B. This therefore enables us to now to support multi-access PDU sessions, potentially via the wireline access gateway function, as we can see on the bottom of the screen, but also now using the wireless network again out through the G node B. Now we should point out, however, in this scenario, 
we must only have a single AMF which is supporting the 5G residential gateway, regardless of which access network is going to be using. However, as opposed to the user plane, then the traffic may go through different UPFs as it exits the 5G core network. That now allows us really to introduce another term which we can see often discussed, which is referred to as ATSSS, the Access Traffic Steering, Switching and Splitting Capability. And as the name would suggest, it allows us to switch traffic between our different PDU sessions. Here we can see one running through the radio-based network and the second PDU session here running through the 5G Y-Line access-based network. So how do we make the decision about where do we send the traffic across the network? This, however, will be based on ATSSS rules applied down to the 5G residential gateway, in addition to various local conditions. So we may split the traffic based on um, interference levels or drop for some reason, or potentially based on the actual type of traffic. Certain traffic may be sent one way across into the core network, whereas a different type of traffic may be sent via the radio network, for example. Likewise, up at the UPF, which here we can see is acting as our PDU session anchor, then we'll be applying N4 rules, but also feedback from the 5G residential gateway, once again determining which of those two PDU sessions the user plane traffic will flow across. Need to know more? Why not visit our store where you can choose from over 200 hours of video-based training? Alternatively, you can contact us to discuss any specific training requirements you may have.